Now, there are people who think that I don't sell myself enough on the internet as an expert on the INFJ personality and personality types, and that I'm too modest. There are also people that think I oversell myself and my books on uh, the internet, and that I'm lacking in modesty. Um, I think this is a testament to the fact that you're, once, you, once you, you, your audience grows to a certain critical level, there's going to be a wide range of reactions to the particular kind of work you do and the, the presentation, you know, your, your mode of presentation and self-presentation. You can satisfy everybody and that's okay. And that if you guys are ever considering starting a YouTube channel or writing books on personality or some other topic, you always have to be aware of it. Appreciating this helps you gain the critical distance to not take things too personally because otherwise it can get kind of ugly sometimes, you know. Anyway, um, this particular video topic is probably going to reinforce the view that <laughs> the, la the, the second view, not the first one, but I wanted to just briefly touch upon, touch on um, uh, what makes me unique as an INFJ expert. Because uh, this question that, I mean, uh, people don't necessarily ask me this question. Um, but I see discussions on Reddit or in email, but for example, on Reddit, you know, like people sometimes discuss my work on Reddit and they often say, you know, that my approach is uh, unique in the sense that it's in depth and heavily informed by philosophy. It's also um, implicit in that, if you like, is a kind of warning against, uh, you know, well, for some people who are not so interested in dense philosophical language, um, that maybe they're not going to resonate with my books. Now, I would argue that, that uh, in my uh, more recent work, I have become a lot more accessible and that I can be enjoyed by people who don't have a particular background in philosophy. And if you guys uh, have experienced that or can confirm that in the comments, that'd be great. Maybe it would inform, uh, you know, the, the, the impressions of people who are considering engaging more with my work more. Um, I would agree that to some extent my uh, familiarity with philosophical concepts and academic training make me unique in the sense that I, I can I can marshal those resources to in you know uh, in support of my analysis of the INFJ personality and other personalities types in general my uh, familiarity with the Jungian concepts my deep reading relatively deep reading of Jung at this point also uh, the fact that I'm taking a psychotherapy course where there's a lot of engagement with Freudian psychoanalysis is also very helpful. In general, you know, familiarity with psychoanalysis is something that contributes to my, to my, you know, the, the originality of my takes and hopefully the depth of my takes. But there's something that I think is not emphasized enough. And it's almost like the first thing that I would mention when I compare my work on the INFJ and other types with other people's work, including people who are theoretical. Okay, because you can, you can think of the distinction to, first of all, as being a distinction, a broad distinction between people who discuss types in a non-theoretical way and people who bring a theoretical frame of interpretation into the, the fray, you know? And certainly I, I bring a theoretical uh, lens to my discussions of the INFJ personality and other personalities. But there's a lot of people on, on YouTube, I mean, you know, as, as more people uh, develop an interest in discussing type on the internet, and you know growing audiences you're obviously going to get more people who are also interested in the theory and so there's going to be a lot of offer in terms of theoretical frameworks to understanding type within that category i'm yet different from most other people and that's something that maybe is not emphasized enough and here i think the distinction that we have to really appreciate i think because it, it is informative to appreciate this distinction it's a distinction between top down top down and bottom up. I mean, I have mentioned this, I have, I have commented on this before in my videos, including recent videos, but it's important to, to, to appreciate that there's a big difference between the top down approaches and the bottom up approaches. A top down approach is akin to a rationalist approach in a philosophical language. A bottom up is more empirical or empiricist, okay? So the top down people are really the majority on YouTube. They come up with theories and then they apply their theories their particular models to everything, right? Which can be really good because it can reassure people that there is this theory, it's set in stone, it's clearly delineated, delineated, it's clearly articulated, and then you can just roll it out, you know? Apply it to everything. The, the downside is they're 
often quite rigid, not susceptible to updates. And it's not always clear sometimes what their relationship to reality and the actual lived experience of people is. They don't tend to take into account the subjective viewpoints, which is a crucial part of typological experience. And they're quite rigid, it's not easy to update, which can also lead to a lot of um, like close, like a lack of openness to, you know, a stubbornness and a lack of openness to alternative viewpoints, right? A kind of tunnel vision. And you see that with a, a lot of theoretical frameworks, including those that are very interesting ones. They're always threatened with rigidity and you don't want that when you're carrying research into something that is always evolving, like the notion of type and the experience of type. And I would say that my, my particular approach is really bottom up. It may look top down at times because the language can be a little bit technical, a little bit informed by philosophy. And sometimes people think that because that language is used, then it must be top down, but absolutely not. All my work, you may, may have noticed that, you know, I started with the ecstatic soul and then I moved on with the infinite soul. Now, there's a clear continuity between those two books, right? But in the infinite soul, I sort of move forward. And even though I'm not really saying that like the concepts I came up with in the ecstatic soul are wrong or obsolete, I am still kind of updating my approach, updating my concepts. I talk about the new subtypes of INFJ, you know, the adaptive submissive, the solipsist, that's not in the ecstatic soul. So research is progressing and I'm looking at new angles. And if I consider that a particular approach is a bit rigid, I am going to update it. My base material, my evidential material is you guys. Without quite knowing it, you are my evidence base. I look at your comments, I look at your reports, of your, I look at your experiences. Of course, I don't mention anyone. I keep the privacy of everyone, everyone. But you are constantly in exchanges with people on Patreon, my supporters on Patreon, email exchanges, discussions with INFJs online uh, via Discord. All this is informing my, my thinking on what the INFJ type is like. And in order to really capture the INFJ experience at an objective level and a level of subjective experience, I use concepts and use models that are there to further the understanding of that crucial intimate experience. And if I can, if I can find better words, better concepts, better models, I will embrace them. So it's bottom up, it really comes from you, it really comes from the lives of INFJ that inspire me, right? Uh, and this is why I don't want to go for that rigidity and I aim to be more democratic. So that's what I would say is different about my approach and will continue to be different. My next book on the INFJ, you will see, will demonstrate that further and hopefully you'll be convinced again. So again, if you're interested in those books, the study, in-depth study of the INFJ mind, still very much relevant in the, is the ecstatic soul, INFJ consciousness and its existential manifestations and its sequel came out very recently, The Infinite Soul on INFJ Life in the Modern World. So it takes the mind of the INFJ and looks at how we relate to the external reality, often seen as hostile, how we can find meaning, purpose, and a happy, rich life in general. Get this book if you haven't yet. If you loved it but haven't reviewed it yet, reviews really help on Amazon for referencing. Thank you for that. And finally, don't forget that the lifeblood of my channel is the Patreon page, where you can make a donation from three and a half dollars a month all added together really really contributes to helping to keep the channel going and we have a growing community there as well you can suggest videos i'm always looking for new content you get some bonus content videos and other things as well consider it and i'll talk to you next time guys okay bye bye